Like the cowboys of the Old West, a group of monks are pioneering a life of hard work and Benedictine spirituality in America's heartland. And you'll hear their story tonight. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paqua and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight served as a Marine and then he left Kansas with 31 other men in the 1970s in order to join a Benedictine monastery in France on the condition that they would eventually be sent back to start a monastery in the United States. After almost 30 years of prayer and work, that dream was realized with the founding of Our Lady of Clear Creek Abbey in 1999, which is in the Diocese of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Here to tell us more is the first prior and now the first abbot of Clear Creek Monastery. So please welcome Abbot Philip Anderson. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good to have you here. Good to have you here. And it uh, sounds like you've, uh, you know, had a fairly adventurous life. Yes, um, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it a little <laughs> bit, yeah. How does adventure feel? Well, you feel alive and you feel like, well, I better just keep having an adventure because if I stop and try to rest, well, then I'm going to feel old. But, uh, you know, Monks are kind of uh, in a spiritual adventure, but there's a physical part too. And living in Oklahoma can be an adventure out in the wilds there. Yeah, that's, now you're not near uh, the city of Tulsa, are you? Well, if you call an hour and a half by car near, yeah, but we are not really too, too near. No. So it's fairly rural. You have it's a very rural, large yeah. amount of land that you've been able to settle into? A thousand acres. These are the foothills of the Ozarks, so it's kind of hilly. It's not mountainous yet, but it's, it's rather pretty. Yes. And Clear Creek is so named because it's crystal clear, except during storms or something, and mm -hmm. we have this wonderful clear water. We swim in sometimes when yeah. no one's looking. Yeah. There you go. And wh where, what led you to go to the Benedictine order and to go all the way over to France to get this idea? Well, that's a good question. How many hours do we have now? Well, uh, Half. It, was, it was a story about converts. I'm a convert and several of us at this monastery in Oklahoma are converts through a program of humanities, a great books program at the University of Kansas of all place. We became during the 70s and the turbulence of campus revolution, we became interested in this radical vision, which is Catholic, instead of a radical vision of revolution, you know, political revolution. And we really wanted, we were looking either for hell or heaven. It was hell first, and then we found heaven was a better idea. So we said, what can we do with this faith, this Catholic faith? And, and someone said, well, why don't you, why don't we start a monastery here in Kansas? There already were some, a lot in America really, but they were part of a first history where they started schools and they were missionaries and they're active. And our professors thought we'd better have a contemplative monastery in the old mold of the antique monastic life of just prayer and work. And so two of these students went off around the world looking and they found a place in France that seemed just the right place. Mm -hmm. And when you're adventurous and you're 20 years old, it seems like the farther away, the better, the more you know, sure. adventurous it is. And we wound up, several, many of us going over there and, and some stayed. Some, so some are still in France? No, some stayed there, like, like me, 
and some didn't make it in the religious life. And those who stayed eventually came with some Frenchmen and, and, and Canadians back to found Clear Creek okay. in 1999. Yeah, I do uh, uh, re recall when that was founded uh, because I, had so, I was doing some teaching in the Diocese of Tulsa uh -huh. uh, while I was at the University of Dallas. So I'd been aware of the founding. Now, ha how is your community done? What's, uh, has it stayed the same, grown bigger, smaller? How have you done? Well, for the times we live in, with uh, you know, the question of vocations being pretty uh, scarce in 80s and 90s, I think we've done quite well we started with 13 and we're up to 44 when I left. Now there might be another one when I get back, but mm -hmm. there were 44 when I left. And for a seminary or some kind of institution where people come in and out, that would not be a lot, but for a, a permanent community, people to enter for the rest of their lives, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good rate of vocations in yes. young men. Yes. And so we're pretty, we feel very blessed about that and want to continue. Even though our monastery only holds about 35, <laughs> So we're building sheds and things outside and they're living in that, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, until we can build bigger buildings. Sure. Now, you know, a lot of folks, uh, my dad was among them, uh, had trouble understanding why anybody would want to be a contemplative when you can instead get out and do something. What would you say to them? Well, I have trouble understanding how you could not be a contemplative, but I guess that's just, you know, for us. We're so active. There was a saying in the Middle Ages, you know, otium negotissimo, in other words, the most active of leisures, because we have la manual labor and we, we do all sorts of, make our clothes. We, there's a lot of activity in that sense that makes a man feel like he's accomplishing something. But it's just the most, the first form of religious life is that why? Well, you have to get back into the depths of what it's all about, the gospel. I like to remind people of the, of the fourth chapter of St. John where you have our Lord evangelizing by himself. The apostles are off somewhere else getting supplies and he, here he is talking with the Samaritan woman, giving the, the essence of things very quickly. And what does he say? That the Father's looking for those who adore, worship. I like the word adore, more of a Latin word, adore in spirit and truth. Wow, no, this, this is powerful. This is, this is what the contemplative life is about, doing that. And everybody, of course, every, every Catholic, every Christian has to do that. But some people have to do it sort of as their specialty. And so that's what we do. You know, we focus on prayer. But the early monks found that if you pray all day, you go crazy. You, it, you just can't do it. So St. Benedict found this balanced way of life where you pray and you work and you have a variety of activities. But the real purpose is to adore the Father and Spirit and truth, to live this deep spirit of the gospel, and then the rest organizes around that. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that um, a lot of folks in the modern world would find difficult because from what you and I have talked about earlier, you don't have a lot of the modern distractions. You're not spending as much time watching football on television as you are praying. That's would right. that be a fair statement? That would be. Yeah. But you see, Father, the young people that have vocations, they're looking for a high ideal. They're not looking for a mediocre, you know, when men get older, they're, they're happy to have a little more leisure or whatever. But the young people, I want to make the monastery that attracts them. I, I, you know, they're the future. And so they want a hard ideal. Sometimes they're looking for something harder than they can really handle, and mm -hmm. then we have to help with that and moderate them. But we want to offer a, a really uh, high sort of uh, goal. And so they understand that, and they want to give up the you know, easy leisure and, and the things. And we, we do, though, have to be reasonable and try to adapt and take into consideration where they're coming from and help them. And we do watch a video once a year or something like this. And, <laughs> You know, uh, it's amazing they do live without it because when you have prayer enough, it takes the place of all that much better. And, and so, you know, it all works out, but it's a challenge. But I mean, who doesn't have a challenge? I mean, you, a challenge. you know, one of the things that has struck me, I've been doing a lot of studies 
of the end of the Roman Empire, its mm -hmm. collapse and the barbarian invasions. And what has struck me is that the most influential, long-term influential people from that period were St. Augustine, St. Benedict, St. Patrick, St. Gregory, all of whom spent time in monasteries apart from a decaying, collapsing, corrupt society. And because they were apart, they were able to give a vision for the future. Do you see this as part of your mission? Yes, I think that's really quite true. You can't draw a perfect parallel, but there's something similar. They say, this is a little bit simplistic, but there's a kind of comparison between St. Benedict, the founder of this whole monastic, you know, they call him the father of the monks of the West, and Boethius, who was a political figure, a Christian, you know, trying to work within the system, he chose to stay and try to work things out in the political life and wound up in prison and, you know, was, was put to death. St. Benedict chose to just go out and live in a cave, and yet he, he did so much more for Europe than Boethius did. It's, it's, it's amazing, but God uses these things. So, so I, don't, I don't know that we can just, you know, base what we do now on what happened then, but I see some real parallels. I think that's very profound. There's a kind of barbarianism now coming as there was in that time when the Roman Empire was falling, and people looking for values. And that's what I meant by, you know, the, going back to the adoration, spirit and truth. Start with the basics and the rest will develop from that. It always has, you know. In you know, you, you said that uh, you're getting an, uh, 44 men, so you started with 13 in 1999, and now you're up to 44. It's a fairly significant increase, you know, percentage-wise and such. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Uh, from where do these, these young men come? Where, how did, where do they come from? Are they all from Oklahoma or where? We've had <clears throat> a postulant or two from Oklahoma, but right now I don't think any of them is from Oklahoma. They're just from all over. We have one from Australia, one from New Zealand, you know, uh, Canadian still, but most are from America now. And it's just really all over, California or you know, Virginia or various places. These new colleges that have a strong Catholic identity, Thomas Aquinas College or Christendom, they're furnishing vocations, homeschooling families. I'm getting young men, very young, that coming out of homeschooling families, and uh, they have read about, you know, some, and sometimes they've read very little, but they're so young and full of dynamism that they learn very fast. They catch up right away. So you have people with less formal schooling than before, but they're like an open book and they learn very well. So mm -hmm. homeschooling families is a source and often people from these uh, new, relatively new Catholic institutions that have a strong Catholic identity. See, I, I think uh, that's something very important. Um, you know, these, you know, I've been involved with a number of these schools, visited uh, quite a few of them, and, and they're not fighting older battles against the faith. These are young people who say, is the Catholic faith is absolutely fascinating, rich, intellectually stimulating, and they just dive into it. And these seem to be coming for vocations to you and to some of the religious orders of women that are growing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, young people talk to one another and they, they find their ways of knowing. I once. <laughs> A bishop in France was telling me, you know, I do all sorts of pastoral programs for vocations, and the few that come never come through our programs. They come from somewhere else because they talk to one another. They know what's going on. They look at websites, and they, you know, and so uh, that's right. And uh, I'm just amazed to see the seminarians that come to our monastery that stay with us, uh, you know, apart from vocations, just young people. And it's not just the young. Of course, we get all ages, but young people are looking for something more adventurous. I would use another word that you'd have to qualify to understand, 
I think is profoundly important in all this, is young people are looking for a life that they find poetic. And I don't mean poetry in a bad sense, like something not real or true. I mean something that, you know, touches their heart. It's not just like a professional formation, you know, or the technical knowledge or whatever. They want to do something that seems like it has a resonance with what people have done, you know, like riding a horse is something that people have done for thousands of years. And now it's pretty much a sport for rich people, I guess. But there's something about this that just is in our psyche or, you know, uh, the monk, even Oriental, you know, Buddhist monks, but there's something that's sort of in the history of the world and young people like that. In some places now, you know, in some more advanced or more, I don't know, uh, developed monasteries where they have big universities and the monks are teachers, well, then the young person sees, well, if I want to be a teacher, I'll be a teacher. To become a monk just then to do parish work or something doesn't seem right. But our form of life being close to the land and being out in nature, it's, it's more poetic. Now, there are more you know, important things in life than that. But for the young people, I think that's initially, they see us as something that strikes a, rings a bell with them, you know, mm -hmm. in that sense. Well, it's, see, that was going to be my next question. In fact, you really got to it. You know, what is it that attracts these young men? So they come from all over. They have, you know, a, a, a clear Catholic identity as part of their background. But what is it then that they look for in the monastic and, again, more contemplative monastic life that you're leading? Well, it's not because they've thought a lot about what contemplation is or, you know, it's just God. I mean, it is, I don't know. It's a mystery. As long as, as long as it's going on, though, I'm going to try to help it. But I, I don't know. You know, there's so many excellent people. In, in communities in America that don't have too many vocations and they're doing everything they can, it's a bit of a mystery. You know, I don't know. Part of it's because it's new, I mean, relatively new, and it's growing. And when they see us building, when, when we start, when we have funds and we, we start building, that seems to attract them. They say, well, something's going on here, you know, and they see other young people with, with a habit on that we're really living life. But it's, it's really a mystery. What attracts them, you know? I don't, I don't know for sure. For me, it was just such a revelation, the church, I mean, it was such a great thing. And to do something kind of radical, strong, not, not you know, uh, everything's, uh, you have to moderate everything in life. Everybody likes to, to, like to do something kind of extreme. I like to do, I like to jump out on a parachute or I have these ideas. But the only thing you can do that's really absolute is in the theological realm, you know, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. There you can, do something all the way. The rest, whether it's fasting or drinking or eating, has to be moderated. But at the heart of our vocation, there's a radical choice. And I think that speaks to everybody at a certain stage of their life, I mean, young people. No, no. one of the, uh, my high school used the Benedictine motto, ora et labora. Right. So prayer and work. And you've been describing aspects primarily of the prayer and the right. contemplation because that's the primary attraction. But as you said, if you pray all day, you'll probably go crazy. So uh, you also work, and that was part of St. Benedict's idea. What kind of work do you uh, have the monks do? Well, we have a variety. Now we have monks studying for the priesthood who have more studies they do manual labor too, and then you have brothers that aren't going to study for the priesthood and they have more time. We have a wood workshop, we have a metal workshop, we have a ranch with sheep and cattle, we milk cows and make cheese that's so popular that we, we can't get it to a store. It's sold right at the Abbey before we can. You don't want to eat any if you can't come back because if you get hooked on it, then you you know you, you won't be able to get any. So did it's you really, bring me any? And no, I didn't. I, See, I, no, uh, I can't even get my fix. But we, you have to fix meals, and so there's the kitchen work, and everyone has to do a little of that. And we, but you see, that's more poetic. Working on a ranch or working out. If we wanted to just make money for the abbots, we would just build a hangar, a warehouse, and put computers and have everybody 
all day under neon lights do something like that. It's hard to earn your living with honest work anymore, <laughs> but it's good for the monks. And so we do it anyway. And little by little, we do find ways of, you know, earning our, our way. But we, one way is just we make our own clothes, we make our own shoes, we, we make our own bread. And so if you don't have to pay for all these things, that's a kind of economy. Sure. So we do a little bit of everything in manual labor, uh, you know. Now, uh, with some of this, did you learn some of these skills, like making cheese and bread, when the monks were in France? Oh, yes, our cook learned to cook there, and boy, you know, they know how to cook in France. I mean, it's not just a myth. I, as a, a monk in a smaller, I was in a bigger monastery for a while, then sent to a foundation in France before coming to the foundation. A foundation is a new monastery. I was in one in France from zero, and then we built up. And I had a chance to do a little bit of everything, including milking cows. Boy, I never thought I'd do that in my life, being from the, the city, you know. I've had a chance to do a little bit of everything, except cook, I've never cooked. But I, I learned a little bit of this, making pottery, and all these kind of things, yes. Mm -hmm. so, we learned in France So there's a, a there's a variety of aspects of um, the, the work that keeps that prayer and work balance. Now, one of the things I believe I've uh, received from y'all are some CDs of chant. Uh, is, is that true that y'all make CDs? Yes, yes. Well, you see, my monastic family, for those who know a little bit about the church history in more recent times, the, the name of Solem was linked to Gregorian chant because after the French Revolution, you know, in the early 1800s, Gregorian chant had sort of become corrupt and they rediscovered through manuscripts and they revived it. And that's sort of part of our family heritage. Right, right. It was, uh, Salem really did a lot of work right. to get the best manuscripts yes. and learn how to use the chant and integrate it into liturgy. And it was much more beautiful than that, what they were doing before that. And so yes. we keep that tradition going of Gregorian chant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, and this is all another part of the, not exactly the contemplation, but chant is part of the communal expression of prayer that is so key to Benedictine life. Well, if you, if you looked into this, and monks know a lot about liturgies, so it's hard to speak, but you know, you, in a certain way, you don't have the complete liturgy unless you have the church's own interpretation of it and the chant will bring out in a liturgical piece a certain aspect of that meaning of it. And so when you have the entire divine office as provided by the church, whether it's the older rite or the new rite, and you have the Gregorian chant, you have the official music, you know, Vatican II said this is, has priority, you know, Gregorian chant is a pride of place. It gives you a certain insight into the text, which is the Holy Spirit is, is guided by the church. So there's a lot there to sacred music. You know. well, see, that I remember reading uh, uh, a really interesting book called Why Catholics Can't, Can't Sing. Sing. Yes, I heard about that. And uh, one of the points he made about chant is that it's humble music. The individual is not highlighted, but there's this chant that everybody does together. They know and they sing along and it doesn't emphasize virtuosity, but rather the communal expression to draw the meaning of the Word of God out through That's music. It. It's all subordinated to the meaning, to the Word of God, but it's not simplistic. It's very rich. The melodies are yes. very rich. Yes. It doesn't, though, give you that kind of, you know, like the, the Italian tenor who's going to give this incredible voice and everyone's going to go, wow, he's just, you know, we, you don't do that. There are very few solos, but it will bring tears to your eyes, especially when you get used to it. You know, I was brought up in popular music, rock and roll kind of thing. My parents were jazz enthusiasts. And I would hear classical music, and, but never quite saw why it was so interesting. But then once in the monastery, 
all other music cut off for about a year or so, only Gregorian chant, then it's kind of like the top of a, of a stream up in the top of the mountains, very pure water. And then when you hear some polyphony, you know, sacred music of the Renaissance, well, then you say, oh, well, that's easier. And now I see why people like that. It's easier and it's magnificent. And then when you hear some Baroque music, you say, oh, well, this is downhill. This is even <laughs> easier in a way than Gregorian chant, but it's much larger. And you keep going downhill till you get to the Mississippi and then the Delta, and it gets pretty muddy down into the, <laughs> the popular music at its, its, its final destination. But it's There's just even some like, of that muddied up quality in some of those hymns I've seen in certain Catholic hymn books, well, you know, where they I, I focus mean, yeah. about themselves and it's how lucky God is to have them there. But it's interesting to take the trip down, but you have to know enough Gregorian chant to really appreciate it before you can then sort of see how this works. But isn't it a mystery? Seven notes in the diatonic scale, an infinite amount of melodies and music comes out of this. It's just sort of like, you know, in creation, you know, plants that come out of seemingly nowhere. It's just really a whole education to study Gregorian chant, you know. And, you know, this, you found, well, now it's a full monastery. It's no it's longer an abbey, a foundation. Yes. It's, an abbey. Right. it's an abbey. Yeah. And, you know, you've had Cardinal Burke come over to visit. Right. He's presently at Rome and he's been uh, to your community and you're continuing to grow. Like you said, some of the uh, monks are living in shacks right now, sheds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're nice enough sheds, but they're sheds. <laughs> <laughs> you can do any more building for them? We want to, well, we have a plan elaborated by a professor of Notre Dame, very fine architect, uh, Thomas Smith and, and uh, in fact, his son is a sculptor and did part of the tympanum. In the front of the church, we're sculpting. I don't know how many people are doing this. We're doing sculpting in stone on our church right now. And uh, Not many. And we have elaborated the whole plan. We've built about a third, which is not bad in 15 years. We said we're building for a thousand years. So, not in a hurry, a thousand years, you know. We want to build something beautiful for God. I, knew, I think that young people are very sensitive to this. You can build a modern building and pray in it. It's fine. You, know, you don't have to have something. But we want something to last. Instead of like a, you know, a, a fast food joint that's going to be built for 10 years and they'll tear it down, we want to build for a long, long time with something beautiful. So we need to continue. But it's St. Joseph's got all the money. It's just when he brings it around, then we'll keep you know, going upwards. Yeah. Yeah. You know, certainly the Holy Family uh, had Magi bringing them gold. Yeah, I've got three fundraisers, you know, and this has to do with Mother Angelica. First of all, there's, you know, the Blessed Virgin, and she has come through often, but she's too nice. She's too nice, you know. The infant Jesus, now he has been big, and he has come through too, but he's kind of a, he's a child. He sort of, you know, follows butterflies. He sort of, St. Joseph, there's a businessman. When we talk to St. Joseph, you know, he's, he, he's, he's really the businessman. But all three are essential. You know, we, we pray the chaplet to the child Jesus every day, all the monks, you know, just for that, for the continued development of the monastery. Great. It's working. And it, it seems to be working not only in terms of external buildings, but most importantly, the living community. Well, that's, that's what we've learned, key. you know, in 1960 or so in America, there were so many vocations in every order and seminaries and Ship. took that a little bit for granted. And then after decades of, you know, kind of vocations drying up, we've learned to appreciate it's the living. And in the, in this, in the ceremony or the, rather the, the liturgy of the dedication of a church, that's the, that's the whole poetry of it, the living stones, you know, that's really where it is, is the living structure more than the externals. But externals, we're Catholic. We, you know, we believe that the body is important and externals have their part in all this. And so for us, the buildings are the right setting as best we can build them, you know, but it's for the living stones, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, we're going to take uh, a little bit of a break. Okay. We're going to come back in about two minutes. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to make to the abbot, please do so. And we'll be back with you for that.
Thank you very much. Welcome back. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to invite any of you, if that can, to please come here on a pilgrimage and be part of our studio audience. Join us in, at Masses that we have every day here, both uh, in the morning and at noon. We'll also be able to give you information about how to get out to Hansful to be able to pray with the sisters. And our pilgrimage department will give you information about places to stay, good places to eat, get some fine Alabama barbecue over at the Golden Rule, or uh, uh, fried green tomatoes. Have you ever had fried green tomatoes? I have don't it? think so. Oh, you have to come back. I have to get you some of that. And um, of course, hamburger heaven. That's where the cows go when <laughs> they make the hamburger. So, but at any rate, if you can, please join us at uh, 205 271 Two nine six six, or go to our website ew10.com, and they'll give you all kind of that information that you need to do that. Also, want to let you know that uh, if you're interested in contacting Our Lady of Clear Creek Abbey, you can go to their website, which is clearcreekmonks.org. ClearCreekMonks.org, or you can also call them 918-772-2454. Now, if you call them, they might be contemplating and praying or working, so they'll get back to you when they can. That's right. Isn't that about right? That's right. All right. We're going to start off with a phone call first. Hello, Mary. Hi. Hi. Where are you from? I'm Minnesota. Oh, great. I understand it's pretty cold up there today. Oh, it is. We're getting our share of winter. <laughs> oh, I guess so. This is the end of global warming. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so what the end of global warming looks like. So what, oh. can we, what can we do for you today? Well, I'm just wondering, how do you know when you have a vocation? And how did they give up everything, like worldly items? And um, we just pray for all of you. God bless you and thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Great question. So how do you know you have a vocation to contemplative life and how difficult is it to give up your possessions? Well, um, <clears throat> what happens is a vocation is a little different with an order like the Jesuits or a particular monastery. With the Benedictines, it's usually you're going to be attracted to go visit a particular place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first time you go, you're going to say, well, how am I going to know? And you're not going to know. But you don't, God doesn't tell you in the beginning everything. You have to go step by step. So a young man typically will come to visit for two or three days. He'll just see what he sees. He'll go home and pray about it. Then he'll know whether he wants to come back or not. And that's all he's going to know. <coughs> Does he want to come back again for a little bit longer stay? And during that stay, he might then know whether he wants to enter the novitiate, which is just discernment. You know, they can leave any time they want. It's five years before you make a final commitment. So you don't have to like go and, and know the first day whether you want to commit your life, you know, completely to this. Although if you had no inkling, you wouldn't do anything. So if you trust, it's like swimming. You have to trust the water, right? You have to trust the water. You learn to trust that God's going to lead you in this and you go step by step. It sort of, it happens. There's a mystery to it that you can't really document or there's something, a personal story. How do you know if you're going to get married? How do you know? I don't know. It's, it, I can't imagine. It's never been married. It's, it's a, just a mystery you go, you go into step by step and a good monastery will help you through the process and, you know, the person will, will get to know. All right. You know. What about giving up stuff? <clears throat> well... You know, the hardest thing to give up is self-will. You know, there's, there's things that are really tough to get up, but give up. But, you know, depending on how old you are and how used you, used you are to things, you know, it can be something of a, of, a, of a wrenching experience. But, you know, what about St. Paul had to give up everything? And what about, you know, uh, that's part of the experience, you know, of, of, a con of a conversion. If you're really serious about God, you expect to have to do something and giving up things is part of it. 
But when you get older and you get more and more used to things, it's harder to imagine. But, you know, the 20 year old, you know, they expect something, something hard. They expect to have to make a sacrifice and they, they, they can do it, you know. I think when I entered the novitiate, I had all of 65 cents with me. Yes. I just paid off, you know, my <laughs> college debts, you know, working over the summer and stuff. And, you know, I, 65 cents wasn't that big a deal. No, 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 yeah. So, um, so it depends on each person's particular history. But, you know, when we have men come in like 35, well, that's much more difficult. They have sure. a lot more things and it's a little harder. But we just have to deal with it. And if they can't, they really can't give up things. Well, they just can't. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to be a monk, you know. Right. You know. So I certainly yeah. have known, uh, I, I know uh, one millionaire in particular who just realized his life was hollow. And he was glad to get rid of it when yes. he entered religious life. He just, just be, get out of my life. Of course, there's a, there's a great story about a desert father. The earliest monks were in Egypt, just the way right. it was, you know. And it, this uh, monk was a, a noble, a patrician in Rome, I mean, Arsenius, I think it's this famous Arsenius. Yeah. And so one day a monk came to a, another monk's cave and there he was with a nice rug and he has a kind of a easy chair in there and a, and a, a servant serving at a table. And he said, oh, this is scandalous. I mean, you a monk, you have got a servant. And he said, well, you know, in Rome I had 500 slaves and I had several mansions, and so for me, just one each chair and a servant is, is very austere. And so they, they were supple about the, what you could still keep there, you know, as a hermit. We're, so, more, we're more standard about what you can keep and what you can't. Right. right. Having the question, ma'am, where are you from? Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Good to have you here. Welcome. And your question? Um, in Regina, we have, uh, I'm director of the Eucharistic Apostle Divine Mercy. We have an adoration chapel there, and we have people come every day to pray. But we always have the problem of not getting enough adorers. With your experience of attracting the men to come uh, to your abbey, uh, do you have any suggestions that uh, would help us to be able to attract people to come to pray? To Well, this is a little out of my realm, but I, I think this Eucharistic adoration is just a key thing. This is so important. Yes. In silence, without any debate, you're just transforming things. So you expect to have to make an effort. What I see is in certain places I know where it's just become a habit, and there'll be even several churches having perpetual adoration, they have no trouble filling the list. It's just in the beginning, you know, getting over that hump where you, people sort of get used to it. So I would not be afraid to propose a lot of adoration, even round the clock. And if you have a program like this that's really audacious, it'll tend to attract them more than if you just do a reasonable amount, a little bit of adoration every day and try to do a, you know. But I, I know it depending on how many, how, how much of a population you have around the place, it could be a challenge. But I think I mean, it's something John so has got a good sized population. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, certainly one of the things uh, uh, you can perhaps advertise is, you know, to ask people, are you tired of the rat race? Come into the quiet, you know, and just invite them to be quiet with Jesus. The way you explain it is yeah. part of it, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You know, and just uh, and invite them into, you know, I mean, one of the very uh, interesting movies of a few years ago was that movie Into the Silence. Yes, I know about that. I've seen a little bit of it. Yeah, it, it was about a Carthusians. Uh, Carthusian monastery, and throughout there was there were just a couple words spoken in the whole hours, but it was fascinating and beautifully shot, and just to invite people to come into the silence and out of the rat race, and that that in itself can be very attractive. And you know, one of the monks on there was one of these students like myself from the University of Kansas, who he, he just had this sort of a little slightly different vocation. Instead of entering the, the abbey I did in France, he went to the Carthusians in France. And, and you know, their life is very similar to ours. In fact, we didn't watch the movie too much. It's just like every day, this is for us, this is what we all do. You know, <laughs> so they're putting their cowls on, they're okay. But when, you, news? but when you're not a monk, it is fascinating to see there's a, there's a monk gonna go feed the cat or something, you know? Uh, and, and it's true, they, had, they really cultivate that, that silence. And not the silence of a graveyard, it's, 
it's scary at first, a little bit of silence, and then you get to be my age and you just can't get enough. You know, you have to always be talking and helping people. But, uh, you know, I think in my, in my case, to just bring some young people and have them do it, even if they're kicking and screaming, and they do it for an hour, they'll be changed. And they may not come back next week, but they'll think about this again maybe a year later, you know, but I don't know how you'd initially get them there. And certainly another thing is to be able to say to people, uh, sometimes in conversation, you know, I just had such a great time, you know, in adoration. I, the peace with which I come out of there is just so wonderful. I think just letting people know this makes the rest of the day worth living and possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, that can be attractive. Have another caller. Hello, Dan. Dan, are you there? Yes, I am. There you are. Where are you from? I'm from Connecticut. Great. And what's your question? Uh, my question is this. Uh, can you explain what is the difference between a prior and an abbot? And secondly, uh, being from Connecticut, we have the very famous Regina Laudis Abbey, which is a Benedictine abbey uh, headed by Mother Dolores Gray. And I was wondering how the ministries of uh, Don Phillips Monastery differ from that of um, Regina Laudis. With that, I'll hang up and thank you. Thank you, Dan. So, prior versus well, uh, abbot. Yeah, there's terminology in all this. It's all very, very logical once you get into it. Everyone's heard of Westminster Abbey or whatever. An abbey is just a large monastery where they have a certain number and, and the uh, head of it is an abbot. And it goes back to just Hebrew, you know, word of Abba, Father. It's just sort of, you know. Uh, and then when you have a monastery that's slightly smaller, uh, you call the superior a prior. Or in an abbey like our abbey, we have the abbot and I have a father prior is kind of the second command and a sub prior, you know. You know, and with the Franciscans, it's vicarious, or they have a different terminology. But there's the abbot, the prior, he's in charge while I'm gone, you know, sure. and then a sub-prior. In a smaller, it can be a, per a perpetually like that. When you have lesser monks, you would have just a prior as the, as the head, the, the superior. It's just a matter of terminology. Sure. Right? And uh, your work versus that of uh, Regina Laudis, the... Well, uh, they have a somewhat similar history in that there was an American there, this is during World War II, and uh, she uh, was at uh, an abbey, I think a Jouar, I forget the name, I think it was Jouar in, in, in France, happened to be there, and she wanted to go back to start a monastery in America, you know, and there was a film about this, you know, Come to the Stables, a very yes. famous very thing, well with, done with actresses movie. and everything. And so, uh, they are Benedictines, as we are. Uh, they practice Gregorian chant. They're one of the few that have, you know, have that. So that's a similarity there. But it's a different congregation, a slightly different customs, you know, and uh, we're not part of the, quite of the same sphere of Benedictines. But they are contemplatives. They don't have any particular ministry. They've been there much longer. They have a longer history in America, and they've sort of taken. Their, they have their own characteristics. Sure. I think we're really different from ours. Right. Yeah, know, we've had them. We don't have uh, any actors in our in our <laughs> monastery that I know of, although they're all kind of actors. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Sir, where are you from? I'm from um, St. Mary's in Chatham and uh, Wachung, New Jersey. Great. And your question? As a catechist, I try to incorporate music, but I'm wondering if there's a basics to chanting or how to make it more appealing. You know, there's nothing worse than bad Gregorian chant. I mean, when you have a choir of really old men that are just hanging in there and it just sounds so bad, you know, it's, it's an art. It's a really a high art. And so the thing here is don't do it unless you can do it right. We have workshops at our monastery. You know, people can contact us and we have resources and we're willing to help with this. And so, you know, I would say once you know how to do it, people, young people will like it a lot, you know. Yeah, well, certainly there have been great popularity with um, uh, music by uh, uh, the 
Monkston in the album called Chant. Yes, I know about and that. And then there was uh, there's some nuns who've had number one albums right. on Billboard. Right. You know, for uh, for Gregorian chant. Right, I know that. Uh, and so they, they uh, do very well with that. Uh, so these are some good things. Let's go to uh, Brad in Georgia. Hello, Brad. Hello, Father. Uh, we have a, a monastery in Conyers. It's outside of Atlanta. It's called the Monastery of the Holy Spirit. Are you familiar with that? Yes, yes. Sure. Yes. Uh, they're the Cistercians, the OCSO of, of the strict observance. What's the difference between yours and theirs? Well, that's a good question. A, a lot, as I said, a lot of the Benedictines in Europe and America have schools because in Germany at some point, the, the Holy Roman Emperor said, if you don't do something practical, you monks, we're going to end your existence. You must do something for the society. So they had to have schools. And at, at that point, and their schools were very good, you know, but Trappists have never had that. Trappist Cistercians, they, they live a contemplative life according to the rule of St. Benedict, and we do too. But they go back to, there was a branch of this, you know, in the time of St. Bernard, when the, some monks wanted a stricter observance than what was going on at Cluny. Our family goes back to Cluny, which is just the biggest monastery there ever was, I think. They had something like 1,500 monasteries under their kind of influence in the high Middle Ages. The church was as big as St. Peter's of Rome. I mean, this was just, but I guess it got a little bit tepid or some thought they wanted a harder life. They wanted a smaller monastery back out in the woods. And that was Molem and then Cito. And they weren't doing too well until St. Bernard came along with 30, you know, brothers and nephews and people and, and they built that up. But uh, it's the same rule of St. Benedict and their contemplative monks without, you know, particular external works. So we have a very similar life, work, manual labor, prayer. They have a little bit stricter on fasting and, and getting up earlier and, and everything, but there's a lot of similarity between also our particular... stricter on speaking. Yes, sign language. We have times of silence too, but we don't use like sign language in the refectory. We just you know, indicate we don't talk in the refectory. We don't use the sign language too much because they found that some of these monks get so good at the sign language that they might as well be talking. They can say, you know, something will happen. One, somebody once wanted to test this and he, and he dropped a false note about some kind of sensational news on a staircase in a monastery. And before the end of silence, everybody knew all about it by, so, you know. So they have chatty hands. <laughs> yeah. So we figure you might as well just, you know, St. Benedict didn't institute that. That came in the, in the Middle Ages, but it's a very fine institution. So their contemplatives, they've written a lot. Thomas Merton is, of course, the famous one that really is, is well known, not only in America, but in France. He was very influential, especially his earlier books. Yes. And, uh, Great history. We, we, we love this, this kind of doctrine about the spiritual life that has a common root with us, and we're, we're very close, yeah. you know. I have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? From Florida. Great to have you. And your question? Thank you. Um, you were speaking, speaking about young people in, in the monastery, and I wondered if you could talk to us about late in life um, um, vocations, people who believe that God has spoken to them and told them to, you know, what, what he told the rich man, mm -hmm. um, sell all you have and come follow me. Very good. I deal with this all the time. I think there's a whole generation, especially of women, when they were young, they were told, don't do this because uh, this is the church is changing and, and you, you don't want to spend your life in a cloister. And then when they got older, now you're too old. And now you can't enter because now you're too old. You know? And so they felt like they've been cheated. You know, a really strict contemplative life, women have told me, that especially for women, you almost have to start before you're 25 to, to be a, a Carmelite of a strict observance. It can be done, but it's just so hard to adapt that, you know, practically it's very hard. But I mean, if God is calling you, God will find the means. There, there are some places where a person can enter, you know, at a more mature age. There are things you can do, you know, in the third order. There's various types of consecration. There's always something that can be done, but it's true that for a strict contemplative life, 
once you get over 35, it's very hard to adapt to this. And in the olden days, you would have like a queen or someone who would leave the world and enter a monastery. It's, it's fine when you have one person among a lot of young people, but if you would have novitiate with, you know, five or six people, you know, in their 40s or 50s, it would just be very hard to do. You couldn't have that sort of cohesion, you know. Uh, so it's never too late to serve God. You just have to see what He really wants. And that doesn't depend just on your will. That depends on what the other institution and you come together about. So a person should just go to the best monastery they know of and take their advice and listen to them and see what can be done, you know. But it's never too late to have a, a vocation, but the circumstances would just depend, you know, and you have to accept the reality that sometimes it's too late to be a certain I th type. I think in Tulsa, uh, Mother Miriam uh, accepts women who are a little bit older. True. And, uh, you know, and, and has a, a feel for that because she also started religious right. life when she was older. So that's one possibility. She's trying this and she has a waiting list of people coming. So she's just beginning. So whether, how this is going to work, we'll see. But she has that courage to, the supernatural courage to try this, you know, and not just, you know, say no to everybody that's right. over 25. Right. All right, let's uh, now go to Linda. Hello, Linda. Linda is St. Louis. Uh, Father, have you, uh, the Benedictines were known for preserving Western learning in Europe. Do you currently have your eye on preserving anything for future millennia? Thank you and peace. Thanks. Well, with the internet and electronic devices, you know, there's not going to be any problem about keeping books, I think, although you know, never know what might happen to the books if somebody decided to try to electronically change them all or something. We want to keep that idea, you know, as applies to our time. And uh, we really put a lot of emphasis on study of philosophy and theology, although the Benedictines really came before the time of the university. That's more the Dominicans' domain. But we really put a lot of emphasis on, and I must say, in the studies we were given at Funcambeau Abbey in France, it was just, I just am amazed at the quality of philosophy and theology we had, thanks in part to a Dominican uh, theologian who helped inspire the courses. So we do, we try to keep a certain tradition of art, music, uh, learning, but we don't have to copy manuscripts because that's, that's already, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's been not, done. It's the understanding of it though, you yeah. know, understanding all this mass of, of, of culture. Is there a integer, does it mean something? That's what I think our, our real role is to try to say, well, what, is, what does all this mean? Not that we would impose an opinion on everyone, but it's got to be, wisdom has to have a certain unity to it. If it's just a million different doctrines and you just sort of choose what you want, well, you're lost, you know? Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that will be something um, that you're preserving a way of life of prayer integrated with work and integrated with liturgical prayer, preserving liturgy that is, you know, it calls us to the beauty who is God. And you know, all, that's all very important things to preserve. I just want to again let you know, you can go to find out more about Our Lady of Clear Creek Abbey by going to clearcreekmonks.org or call them 918-772-2454. Father Abbott, thank you very much for thank you. being with us. It's been a great it's, uh, been a delight uh, to have you and bring this information. You know, if you would, please join me in giving a blessing to our audience. Okay. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine right. upon you and lead you in all of your ways by His peace. Bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you know, we can bring you uh, these programs and all the other shows that we do, and have these guests inform us, inform us into better Catholics because the network is brought to you by you. So please help to support us. Keep us in between your gospel 
your electric bill and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all our bills too. Thank you.